Amen. So this series is called 40 Days of Joy, and I'll be really honest as I've been diving into this uh, subject matter, there's so much for me to talk about on this subject of joy, um, mostly because all of us need a little more. All of, mo- all of us are struggling to find it in our world. All of us need to hear this. I'm literally praying to God and saying, God, can I change the, the graphic to red and green and just stay in joy for Christmas season? <laughs> he hasn't told me no, so we'll see where we go. But um, for this message today, I was just praying about what God wanted me to share. And um, this has been a really busy week. Can you guys tell that this has been a really, really busy week from trying to coordinate with over 40 volunteers and 20 different projects and visit with homeowners and recruiting other people and, and our, and our, and our, our neighborhood is a buzz with what's going on. Our neighbors see everything that's going on. They knew that we had a costume party on Tuesday night, and they were so thrilled that we're doing things to reach into our community. I got to talk to one of the neighbors down the road, and he was asking about our food bank, and I told him about, we have a blessing box coming, and he says, I have a wood shop out here. I would love if you would, if you needed my wood shop for anything, you can build it right here. You don't have to build far away. And just people are excited about what God's doing here. We are doing something to spread joy during this 40 days of joy. And when I say we, I really mean God. Because it's Him who works through us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Isn't that what the Bible says? He works through us. So if we're spreading joy, ultimately what we're spreading is Christ, is Jesus. And, And as I think about this relationship with Jesus, I wanted to talk about a word that seems like it don't belong unless we're being really honest. Anyone ever have a moment of real honesty? Okay, so there's this word. This is a great word. This this may be one of your favorite words. Let's say it out loud. Adequate. Don't you love that word, adequate? Don't you love going to the store and you go through your favorite candy aisle and you buy a Mr. Adequate bar? (laughs) Aren't you waiting to meet the woman of your dreams so that you can drop to your knees and say, I want to spend forever with you because you're adequate. Adequate? Do we really want adequate? but don't we settle for it almost all the time? Don't we settle for it in our, in our faith? Most of the people I know, if they had a moment of honesty, again, just, just one moment of honesty, they want just an adequate amount of Jesus, right? You know what the adequate amount is, right? <laughs> fire insurance. (laughs) I want just enough Jesus to make sure that I don't have to worry when judgment day comes. I I, I want an adequate. What does adequate mean? I looked adequate up just in case there's someone who don't know what adequate means. It's the definition of adequate. It's sufficient for a specific need or requirement. And then I love this one. Also, it's good enough. It's good enough of a quality that is good or acceptable. How many people like going out to your favorite restaurant? Who's been to a restaurant in the last couple months? Who's paid a lot more than it used to cost a couple years ago at said restaurant? Who is blown away by you? Like you're, okay, so I'm paying three times the price, but the food is kind of adequate. Maybe not as good as it used to be when I was paying less money, but it's still adequate and we still do the nice Christian thing and we give our 20% tip. If you don't know that, you should give a 20% tip because if you ever knew anybody who was uh, a waiter or a waitress or a server, you'd know they work for about two bucks an hour and they live off of your tips. So public service announcement. (laughs) <laughs> I 
of a quality that is good or acceptable. So who went into that restaurant saying, I hope the food is adequate? There's only one restaurant I go into and I say that to myself as I'm going in. It, they could just change the, the, the red and yellow sign to McAdequate. <laughs> Isn't it quite McAdequate? Like you don't go to McDonald's looking for um, Culver's Burger. Or even a steak. Yeah. But, it, but it's adequate when you need to feed, eat fast, eat cheap, and there's always one there, right? And sometimes we all, even though we know we might not supposed to be settling for McDonald's, we often sometimes do. And if you don't, I want you to give yourself a hand if you haven't. Praise God. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, so as I'm thinking about the adequate, last week I brought up this, uh, this concept of joy. And I talked about turning up the joy temperature in our lives. And um, I, I said, which one are you? Are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? The difference being is a thermometer has no power to change the temperature in the room, right? But a thermostat, as a matter of fact, I'm a little bit warm right now. If somebody could turn on, oh, never, never mind. I'm, I'm just, I am hot, but don't do it, Scott. You, you don't have to leave the camera. <laughs> but if you want to turn up the joy temperature in your, in your uh, home, there are things you can do to turn up the joy temperature in your home, right? Hey, let's go do something. Right? Let's, let's quit sitting around and staring at our phone and let's, let's go to a corn maze. Right? That's something that can turn the, the joy temperature up in your house. But if you want to turn the joy temperature up in your community, I think we did a good job of that this week, didn't we? Didn't we do a good job of turning up the joy temperature in, in our community? So, so we have this ability to, to turn up joy. The problem is, is, we also have two enemies. One of the enemies I mentioned sometime during the service today, probably in the prayer time, maybe even before you guys got here. I don't remember, but I said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, but against powers and principalities and darkness and evil and all of these things that we know that heaven is real and... God is real and the enemy is real. And we, we know about that, but what about the second struggle? The settling for adequate. Don't we do that in our houses? Don't we? All right. I have a friend, I won't mention his name in case he ever sees it, but he keeps the thermostat in his house at about 63, maybe 65 degrees in the middle of the winter. Is that adequate for most people? <laughs> okay, there's a couple of you that are like that. <laughs> and in the summertime, there are probably people here who ne almost never turn on your air conditioner. Is there anybody who almost never turns on your air conditioner? Because whatever temperature it is outside, you've deemed adequate. It's adequate. It's not comfortable, but it's adequate. And, and then most of us, Take it even a step further and, and we has, everything has to be perfect, right? Everything has to be, um, you see that thing that says 72? Yeah, that's pretty, that's right about where I like my thermostat at. I, I like it pretty uh, normal temperature almost all the time. Um, I found as I've gotten older that I used to be able to deal with cold. And now when it's cold outside, my bones are cold? Does anybody else get this? Like, I know, I, I turn my temperature up, it's at 72, but like, it's not cold in the room, but my bones are cold, so I feel cold. But, which one are you? Are, are you a thermostat? When, when you think about joy, are you a thermostat? Do you go around spreading joy? Do you try to turn up the joy temperature wherever you are when things are really cold, or do you? Walk in singing that old country song. Is it cold in here? Or is it just you? 
(laughs) Or does somebody else walk in thinking that about you? (laughs) Don't look at anyone. (laughs) All right. So what, 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 is the, what does this have to do with the book of Philippians? What, is, what does Philippians have to say about those two enemies? The enemy of, you know, darkness, but also the enemy of our, our self, where we're just, uh, I'm kind of grumpy, I'm kind of miserable, and I kind of like it that way. <laughs> Reminds me of the scripture in the third chapter of the book of Revelations when Jesus comes to this church and it's in Laodicea and he says, you think you're rich and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're poor and miserable and blind and naked. You are lukewarm and loving it. And oftentimes we get that way in our faith. We get that way in joy. We just kind of go through We just want to be normal, right? Normal. I don't want to try to change anything. I want it to just be normal. Can't things just be normal again? Can't we just be like everybody else? Because I want everybody to read along with me. This is one of the most important things that you're going to realize when you are facing enemies. So this is the biblical prescription for facing enemies. What do enemies try to do? intimidate you. So let's read that yellow words out loud. Don't be intimidated. What happens when you're intimidated? You back down, right? You back down, you recoil, you step back, you shut up, right? Don't be intimidated in any way by who your enemies. So who are those enemies? The world, the flesh, the devil, yourself, Yeah, let's read the green part. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. So when your enemies are trying to get you to back down, when your enemies are trying to get you to live comfortable, when the enemies are trying to steal the joy out of your life, and you're like, I'm not going to let the enemy steal up my joy. Because I know that Nehemiah chapter 8 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm not going to, I'm not living in a world where it's a safe place to lose my strength. We're in a, we're in a world where you'll get chewed up and spit out if you don't maintain your strength, maintain your joy. But this keeping your joy, this not being intimidated will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. Let's read the blue. But that you are going to be saved. How do you know you're going to be saved? Let's read the pink. Even by God Himself. Whew. It's funny. One of my favorite scriptures. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So God is love. And God has called us to fight differently. You know, we, we don't fight like the, the, the world fights. We just sang that song. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. Right? That's, that's how we fight, right? You been fighting that way or you just been getting trampled? Yeah. I I love to share the the honesty because it feels that way. Um so we fight on our knees. And I believe that because God is love that he's given us this weapon and that weapon is love. But if love is our weapon, joy is the ammunition. I want to talk to you about adequate for a minute. If love is our weapon, then joy is the ammunition. Have you ever begrudgingly done the loving thing? (laughs) Don't we? Don't we all the time? But don't we want to be more than adequate? Don't we want to love more than adequately? 
Don't we want to love with joy? Don't we want to have th- this joy? That joy is, uh, is the happiness of love, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, joy. It's actually joy is found in love. It's like ammunition. It's like the bullets for the chamber if love was a gun. If you have love without joy, you have an ineffective weapon. So, so like anybody who has firearms in your house, you're supposed to keep it unloaded, right? Because nobody gets hurt from a, from a firearm that has no bullets, right? Yeah. Nobody's going to get helped by a love that has no joy. If love is our weapon, joy is the ammunition. How do I know that joy, that joy is the ammunition and that love is a weapon? The apostle Paul actually says it in the book of Romans, a different letter than Philippians, but he says to, uh, to love our enemies. He says to love our enemies. As, as a matter of fact, he says it like this when people are mistreating you. He says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. And if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. I love this. You think it's not a weapon? You think love isn't a weapon? Check it out. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. It's like God saying, okay, I'll give you a weapon. People are mistreating you. Here's the weapon. You keep doing what's right. You keep doing what's right by them. You keep loving. You keep giving. You keep serving. You keep doing the right thing, and we do our best to stay adequate, right? Oh, God, I can't keep doing this. Help me. God, you know they're just using me. God, you know they're never going to. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Let's read this yellow part out loud. Next verse in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. Let's all sing Kumbaya. <laughs> oh, that makes us want to turn the joy temperature up, doesn't it? We all look forward to suffering for Jesus, don't we? Love has always got some sacrifice to it. Every time you love, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. Sometimes it'll cost you friends. Sometimes it'll cost you respect. Sometimes it'll cost you popularity. Love is always going to cost you something. But the good news is, if you suffer, let it be for Christ. Uh, And the next verse. So if that one didn't get you feeling all kumbaya, (laughs) maybe the next verse is for you. Let's read this out loud, the yellow. We are in this struggle together. Okay. So the struggle is, the struggle is real, right? (laughs) The struggle is real. I was recording. uh, It was like after 10 o'clock at night, Home Depot had already closed. I went and picked up the last things we needed for the projects on Saturday. And I'm out in there, out in Home Depot's parking lot, realizing that I hadn't recorded my video for the 40 Days of Joy yet. And I needed to get it up by midnight because I said there would be one every day. And I'm a person who likes to keep my word as best I can. I don't always because... Uh, I got a shot glass size brain and buckets of stuff being dumped in it. Uh, but if I can, I keep my word. But I, I'm at Home Depot and I'm starting to record this. And I started that video with the words, let's say it out loud, the struggle is real. And somebody was in the parking lot in their car started cracking up laughing so hard that, <laughs> that I had to stop the video and I started laughing with him because the, I think everybody feels this, right? That the struggle is real. 
And the Apostle Paul says, and you have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Anybody else in the midst of it? In the midst of the struggle is real. So I have good news. The struggle is real. But it doesn't have to be alone. You hear that? But it doesn't have to be alone. I want you to look at somebody near you and say, it doesn't have to be alone. If you got somebody you love in here, you can get up and go talk to them. I don't care. And you just tell them, it doesn't have to be alone. God gave us each other. Because what happens with the struggle is if, if we carry the struggle together, do you know that it, that it divides the weight? It's kind of like if you got a big box to carry and you carry it all by yourself and it's really hard. But if you, but if you get a friend over, it's a little easier. If you get a really strong friend, you can hand it to them. And then it comes really easy. Oh wait, that's carrying one another's burdens. That's not. <laughs> Like a large tarp full of leaves, yes, with a child inside. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, the struggle is real, but it does not have to be alone. God is for you, not against you. God is for you, not against you. And he is alive in people that are in this room who are for you and not against you. And you don't have to struggle alone. You know, the Bible was written as a letter. And I don't think that when this letter was written, that it went from chapter one to chapter two and it had all the numbers and all of that, I think it's just part of the letter. So the very next verse, the very next thought that came from the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul, to the pen, to the page, and eventually delivered to the church in Philippi and translated and, and brought down to us through the ages so we would have this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Are your hearts tender? You might need to turn the joy up in your life if you're feeling the tender and compassionate wavering. Let's read this out loud. Then make me truly happy. Uh, that in parentheses is the NIV version. It says, make my joy complete. So how do you make joy complete? How do you, how do you make joy complete? Here, here's the, here is the recipe, right? From, let's read it blue. By agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? That's easily said, but that's hard to agree whole Heartedly. That's why I often say the world would be a better place if everyone was a little bit more like me. <laughs> you said it too, don't lie. <laughs> You're in church. <laughs> oh, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another. And I love this green verse, and I'm loving that, that it landed on this week that I would be talking about this, because that's what we just did. That's what we just watched the video about. That's what we did on Tuesday night at Cup of Grace when we hosted the costume party and had all kinds of kids and so, lots of them that have never been to our church before. I don't know if they've ever been to a church at all before, but they were here for that, because what were we doing? We were working together with one mind and purpose. 
This is how you make joy complete. This is how you put bullets in your glove gun. Love is our weapon. Joy is the ammunition. Love is our weapon. Joy is the ammunition. And I have one thing to say that if you're running low on joy, (laughs) consider the chamber you have placed yourself in. Read somewhere, probably some John Maxwell leadership thing that I took, but there's a statistic that says that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And I remember from my old, uh, anybody ever like watch Tombstone or any old cowboy movies, like old cowboy movies? You remember their pistols, they were six shooters, right? So there were six bullets in the chamber. It's almost like five people, six people. So you, you kind of, that's why I use that word chamber. So if bullets are your ammunition, the people you're spending the most time with are, are, are should be people who you are able to pour joy into them and they are able to pour joy into you and you are able to have relationships that turn up the joy temperature in your home and your community and your family and your that, that that's the kind of people we want to be around and those are the people that I would encourage you if you know those kind of people make time to spend with them create time be purposeful about having time to spend with them have i mentioned that tuesday nights from 6 to 8 is a great time to spend with them it really, really is. There's all kinds of things going on. If you want to do a Bible study, we've got that too. But if you just want to hang out and spend time and, and, and today after church is a great time to do that. I hear Noah's nook loves when we flood the place. <laughs> but consider the chamber you have placed yourself in. Is it, do you have people? Oh. Because the plans God has for you are, are more than adequate. Let's say that. The, the plans God has for me are more than adequate. Say it one more time. The plans God has for me are more than adequate. More than adequate. God doesn't look at you and He wasn't so in love with you and said, They're adequate. I guess I'll sacrifice my son for them. Do you think he said that? No, he was so in love with us that he was willing to die. He was dying to know us. It was with a burning love, with a passion that he loved us. It was with a passion that is so much more than adequate, but we settle for adequate. God, help us to stop settling for adequate Help us, God. It's only by your power. It's only by your strength we'll be able to do it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord, and I thank you that you have loved us so much more than adequate. That you have loved us with a love that can't be comprehended, with a love that can't be measured. And you have called us to be people of that same kind of love, Lord. I pray that you would fill us with your joy so that we could have ammunition in our weapons of love, God. Not not that we would seek to manipulate, but that we would seek to serve. So that we can see your hand, that we can see your face so that we can see you move in our families, so that we can see you move in our community, so that we can see you change our world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.